Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the second session, second talk of the academic check of State of the Map Online Conference 2020. Um, um, if, if you missed uh, the first uh, talk, so the academic track is taking place for the third time in a row in State of the Map. We have a bunch of exciting uh, academic research related talks about OpenStreetMap or using OpenStreetMap data. Um, if you want to know more about the academic activity in OpenStreetMap, you are welcome to join the OSM Science mailing list. Um, just look it up. Um, and uh, two quick notes before we start. Um, I'm, after I'll finish uh, uh, presenting our talk, the, the talk that we're gonna have now, we'll watch together the, the talk and then we'll have a Q&A session. So if it's your first um, state of the map uh, online uh, uh, session, uh, uh, to, um, to, leave a, to, to, to post a question, uh, you need to log on to the um, to the uh, question pad. Uh, um, so you need to go to the state of the map website, click on the program, scroll down to uh, the uh, talk you're interested in. In this case, measuring open street map building footprint completeness using human settlement layers. Click on it, and on the left side, you will have a session pad where you can. Uh, freely enter your questions while uh, Ardi would be uh, talking and uh, even during the, the Q&A session. Uh, if you want to know more about our talks, uh, you can uh, look up our proceedings. We have published them just before the, the conference started. It's a bunch of abstracts, uh, extended abstracts, uh, uh, explaining more about the talks that are included or the words that are included in the track. Um, it's hosted on Zenodo, uh, it's open access, and you just you can just Google State of the Map 2020 proceedings and you'll get there. Um, yeah, so, um, so we're now moving on to our second talk, uh, and the speaker is Adi Oden. He's a geospatial analyst in Thinking Machine and Data Science Consultancy based in the Philippines. He's passionate in using GIS to medical organizations to make data-driven decisions. He has worked with UNICEF, the Data Computing Research Institute, and different companies throughout Southeast Asia to provide business insights and to solve research problems using spatial analysis and web mapping. His research interests include GIS, data science, deep learning with satellite image and remote sensing. And today he's gonna uh, present a um, new method for uh, based on human settlement layers and GIS operations uh, to assess the completeness of building footprints. So let's watch the, um, the talk. Good day, everyone. My talk today will be about a problem that we worked on that involved OpenStreetMap and GIS. Just an introduction, my name is Ardi Orden. I work as a geospatial analyst at a consultancy in the Philippines called Thinking Machines. Our company helps our clients make better data-driven decisions through business intelligence, data warehousing, and data science. My role is to provide domain expertise with GIS using spatial analysis and web mapping. The slides for this talk can be found in this bit.ly link shown on the screen. I'm excited to get a chance to use GIS to solve different types of problems. And today I'm going to talk about one of the problems that we worked on. This problem is about finding where unmapped areas are. And I'll be talking about the method and the tools that we used. So as some of you might know, there's a map of the world called OpenStreetMap or OSM. What's the difference between this and Google Maps? There's basically three main differences. OpenStreetMap is free, editable, and the data is available to anyone. But for this talk, the most important thing to remember is the fact that OpenStreetMap or OSM is editable. There's a whole community of people who contribute to OSM similar to like Wikipedia. OSM is very comprehensive and there's a lot of data that people contribute. There's data about hospitals, schools, malls, roads, buildings, mountains, rivers, and plenty of others. 
and there are a lot of map changes that are happening every day. Because of the amount of data, there are a lot of important uses for it now. For example, different organizations use OSM to plan relief efforts during disasters. In the past, OSM was used to help with the response to the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, the 2014 typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, and the Ebola outbreaks in Africa. On the public service side, I've met some civil servants from the Philippines who have said that they use OSM to improve their public services to their citizens. We have to remember, though, that there's only a limited number of volunteers, and they can only map so much. And there are still a lot of areas where there are no maps. And we believe that these unmapped areas are a problem, especially if there are people living there. Because whenever there's disasters, those people will be neglected. The reason is because no one knows where their houses are. No one knows where they live. And since no one knows where they are in general, the organizations giving out aid won't be able to reach these people. There's actually a need to map the unmapped areas. In the Philippines, there's an active community of people who contribute to OSM. We wanted to help them by number one, showing where the mapped areas and unmapped areas are. And number two, measuring how much needs to be mapped still. What we're measuring is the completeness of the data. We decided to focus on measuring the completeness for building footprints. We did some digging and we found that there's a previous work where they measured the completeness of building footprints. And they, do, they did this using a mix of GIS and machine learning or ML. And this is where our work comes in. We present a modified methodology that's simpler to implement and still provides insights regarding unmapped areas. Our proposed methodology has three steps. I'll explain each step so that it's easier to understand. The first step is vectorizing the settlement layer. A settlement layer is an image about areas in the world where people live. I included that image here at the right side so that you can see what a settlement layer looks like. The settlement layer came from the Facebook Data for Good project. So it's an initiative by Facebook to release open data for everyone's benefit. The data of a settlement layer is like the black things that you see here. So these are the pixels of that image. Each black pixel that you see is an area with a population. In other words, each pixel shows where people live. That's the explanation for the settlement layer. The explanation for vectorizing is that it's a processing step that involves turning the image into a different data type. So you're just converting the data type of the image. And we do this so that we can perform the next step, which is the spatial join. So a spatial join is a way to join two data sets using their spatial relationship. So the spatial relationship that we're using is called the intersection, and it's just like what it sounds. That's the technically complete definition of a spatial join. But the other explanation is that it is a way to find the intersection of the settlement layer and the OSM buildings. As you can see in the image, there are black pixels, which are the settlement layers. So here in the image in the right side. And there are also green polygons, which are the OSM buildings. The output of this step is the intersection of the settlement layer and the OSM buildings. I'll go to the next slide to show what the output looks like. So that's what it looks like. Let me go back just to compare. Here. The output shows which areas are mapped, the one in blue, and also which areas are unmapped, the one in orange. This output is then used for the next step. The third step which is calculating the percentage completeness. The formula is simple. It's just arithmetic based on the number of pixels that intersect with the OSM buildings. Those are the three steps in the methodology. The main assumption behind the method is that the settlement layers can be used as a proxy ground truth. 
the settlement layers are giving the location of built up areas. So in a, in a sense, they're giving up the location of the population. We made a web map to show the output for the Philippines. And uh, here's a screenshot. Orange means that it's unmapped and blue means that it is mapped. One cool thing that we did is to show a button that will link you to OpenStreetMap if you want to contribute. Try it out later and see it for yourself. You can access it at mapthegap.thinkingmachines. Uh, you can zoom in and check out which areas are mapped and unmapped and so on. We also wrote a blog post about this so that we could share our work with others. And what's interesting is that the Mapbox community team reached out to us and they asked us to do it for Madagascar as well. You can check out both the blog and the website with the Madagascar data in the site below, in the links below, I mean. I did mention earlier that there is a previous work that measured data completeness for OSM building footprints. Uh, this previous method was created by a group from a company called Azavea, and they did this in partnership with Development Seed. Development Seed is a mapping company that works with nonprofits, and they measure data completeness in order to understand the progress and completeness of malaria campaigns in Africa. You can check out their repository on GitHub, and you can find out more details about their methodology over there. To summarize the differences, there are like three main differences between the methodologies. First is that they used WorldPOP instead of the Facebook High Settlement Layer or HRSL for their settlement layer. And just to clarify, uh, both settlement layers used machine learning to detect built up areas from satellite images. That's a given. The difference is in the resolution. The difference is that World Pop has a lower resolution, which is 100 meters per pixel, as compared to HRSL, which is 30 meters per pixel. HRSL was only available for a few countries in Africa during the time that Development Seed did their study. When we did our study, it was available for more countries, and we believe that it would be interesting and useful to use HRSL instead of World Pop. Second, is in the pre-processing. They rasterize their buildings instead of vectorizing their settlement layer. The settlement layer they used, let's recall, has a settlement layer, has a resolution of 100 meters. And they were concerned with the resolution difference with the buildings. On the other hand, the resolution of the settlement layer we used was 30 meters. And because the resolution is higher, the difference, in, the difference between that and the building resolution is not as big of an issue. The third is with the data completeness calculation. They used machine learning to predict the data completeness. And we use arithmetic. So both methodologies did use GIS. Both, both methodologies got the intersection of the settlement layer with the OSM buildings. However, they proceeded to give the outputs of the GIS model to a linear regression model. In contrast, we gave the outputs of the GIS model to just do arithmetic. And the advantage of using this is that it's simpler to implement and it still provides insights regarding where unmapped areas are. Now we get to the results. Based on the building footprints from January 2020, the percentage completeness is 32.75% for the Philippines and 10.89% for Madagascar. This indicates that there are still a lot of unmapped areas in these two countries. Just some notes. Number one, the human settlement layer is dated June 2019 for the Philippines and October 2018 for Madagascar. So the Percentage completeness, if we use a different date for the settlement layer, might be slightly different. As mentioned earlier, percentage completeness is calculated using the arithmetic of map pixels and non-map pixels. We'd like to note, though, that this means that percentage completeness is a correlated metric for building footprint completeness, but it's only a proxy. The pixels don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence with the building footprints. 
as as you might have recalled from the image earlier, there are times where a single pixel has multiple building footprints in it. But for the Philippines, we did some analysis on the relationship between data completeness and urbanization. So most of our analysis is going to be on the Philippines. And in the Philippines, we found that most of the unmapped areas are rural. A large number of level 4 admin boundaries have a percentage completeness of less than 10% for rural areas. And this makes sense since most of, the most of the Philippines is tagged as rural. Each admin boundary in the Philippines has a tag whether it's urban or whether it's rural. And this is for the level 4 admin boundary. What we decided to do next is to aggregate it to a larger admin boundary, the level 3 one, which is the municipality level. We then plotted the rural percentage completeness versus the urban percentage completeness. Here we see that the municipalities appear to group together into two categories. One is barely mapped, the one on the lower left, and the other one is thoroughly mapped, the one on the upper right. And we believe that this is revealing of the way the OSM community maps areas. A possible explanation is that the OSM community focuses on thoroughly mapping one municipality first and focusing on the high population municipalities rather than focusing on mapping everything equally. Our analysis of this is that it's in the interest of time because there's only so much mapping that the volunteers can do. So that's why there are still a lot of areas here in the lower left that are yet to be fully mapped. And again, analysis for the Philippines, we took a look at the relationship between data completeness and poverty. We took poverty incidence data from 2015 at the municipality level. Uh, this is taken from national statistics. Interestingly, poverty incidence is not correlated with data completeness. What this means is that whether or not a municipality has complete or incomplete OSM data, it's not an indicator of whether that municipality will be wealthy or whether it will be poor. Of course, we'd like to note that a caveat of this analysis is that the poverty data is from 2015 and the percentage completeness is for 2020. So it may be that there are actually areas now that are richer or are poorer and the data completeness will reflect a more understandable trend. We also created a bivariate corruptive map to visually look at the poverty incidence uh, with respect to data completeness. And here we do see that there is a spatial trend in the sense of the poverty incidence. So in the northern part, there is low poverty incidence. and in the southern part of the Philippines, there is a high poverty incidence. In terms of data completeness, though, there is no apparent trend. So this is in line with the graph shown earlier. So there are areas that are poor but have completely mapped and areas that are rich but are not yet mapped. And although this is like a visual analysis, we recommend doing a more rigorous uh, data analysis and spatial analysis on this. Uh, something interesting might be looking at just one area locally. Since if you look at one area locally, like for example, the southern part of the Philippines, you might see a sort of a trend or a relationship with the completeness and the poverty then. So that's it for the analysis. And I'd like to double back on the implementation of the method. So initially, the implementation of the method was done in QGIS. And for those who aren't familiar, QGIS is a software slash program for doing GIS and it has a user interface. And what this means is that it's easy to prototype whatever you can think of, and it's also easy to view your data. At first, our goal was just to create a web map in the blog post, and that was it. Create that and then share the results of that for the Philippines. In that sense, we were successful. At the same time though, we wanted to do more. For example, members of the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, or Hot OSM asked us if it would be possible to update the results more frequently. And we also started thinking about getting the completeness results for all of the countries that have HRSL data. Basically, 
we want to improve the reproducibility and the scalability of the implementation. We looked into ways into automating the workflows in QGIS and also using the QGIS API. However, we wanted to increase the scalability and the reproducibility. And we realized that QGIS was unfit for our use case. QGIS is not easily scalable because the data processing is it's just in one computer and it's not easily parallelizable. Doing it in QGIS is also not easily reproducible, especially if people do not have training with GIS software. So we decided to migrate our workflow to GeoPandas and Raster.io instead. You can check out the source code on the GitHub link down here in the left. Yeah, you can file issues and pull requests there. And um, yeah, we migrated the implementation and we were able to speed up the workflow. Um, so the reasons that we were able to speed it up are because number one, uh, we were able to migrate to the cloud and increase the compute resources. This is the biggest one. So now that our code is in Python, uh, we could just put it in a virtual machine and then increase the compute resources of that virtual machine and then it would run fast. Number two for the reason in speeding up the workflow is that we now have Python for all of our end-to-end -end stuff. Now that everything is in Python, we can do the data downloading, the data processing, and the data analysis all in one place. We're doing it all in Python. It's more efficient that way. And I think another useful thing with migrating to Python is improving the shareability of our work. I personally believe that GIS is going to be even more interdisciplinary in the future. And by releasing our work in Python, we're able to reach people outside the GIS community. People like researchers, software engineers, and data scientists, and people from all different types of research fields. And just to close, I'd like to mention our next steps. The first is to get the percentage completeness for all countries that have HRSL data. Um, if you're interested in getting that data as well for whatever purpose, um, you can find that in the link here in the lower left. That data is in the Humanitarian Data Exchange. It's available under the Facebook organization. So Facebook releases their data there. The second is to set up a data pipeline to get frequently updated results. So we already have code for the methodology. And we can already run the code to get the results. And what the data pipeline will do is to just make sure that the code runs frequently and that we get our results frequently. And the web maps will be updated to show the most recent data. So there's a lot of engineering challenges there, uh, but we're looking to work on it in the future. And that's basically it for the talk. Uh, we just like to give a special thanks to the Philippine OSM community for all of their contributions to the map. Uh, we encourage everyone to try out the method and see the results for your own countries. And I'm sure that uh, sharing the results with your local OSM community would be appreciated. We'd also like to thank Hot OSM this work is driven by our desire to help out Hot OSM in their goal to map the entire Philippines, and we're glad to help in whatever way we can. We'd also like to thank everyone at Thinking Machines uh, for giving us feedback on our work. And thank you all for listening. You can check out our work at GitHub, and you can check the slides from this talk in this bit.ly link shown here. I'll now be taking questions, but if you'd like to get in touch with me after this talk, you can email me at rd at thinking machines. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Adi, for another interesting talk. I can see in the in the thread that there are quite a few questions. I uh, personally appreciate. Uh, your contribution to the body of work that um, considers building completeness by presenting uh, a very approachable uh, method that is easy to follow and seems to be easy to implement. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'll try, let's start with a few uh, questions that um, um, oh, like are basic even technical ones like uh, Fia is asking how, how long were you able to process the whole data in the Philippines? 
And um, Felix uh, asked whether it's the, the, the completeness data set are available for download uh, for Madagascar and the Philippines. Oh, okay. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending the talk. And I'm really thankful for the organizers for helping out, as well as the editors. Um, to answer the question about how long it took, so we ran it in a virtual machine with around eight CPUs and like around 64 gigs of RAM. Um, we took us around like two hours to do it for the entire of the Philippines. Um, and then regarding the data set for the data, set, the data completeness, we have the data set available in our website. It's at uh, mapthegap.thinkingmachine. Um, so yeah, you, you can check out the data completeness for Philippines there. Um, right now, we don't have data completeness for Madagascar, but um, we're hoping to release it for there as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so anyone interested can start exploring that. Um, I see there's a bunch of questions about um, the settlement layer and the uh, Facebook settlement layer, um, about its accuracy, and I would add uh, the temporal dimension, how frequently it's being updated, especially as, as OpenStreetMap is hopefully being updated in those areas uh, uh, more frequently, probably. Um, yes. So uh, another question is about um, uh, the, the, the settlement layer focuses on mapping population. And so um, did you treat this and whether that affects your method? So in other words, uh, your method is good in identifying uh, false negatives, meaning places where um, buildings should have been mapped but weren't mapped. But what about uh, what you would consider false positives, uh, buildings in OpenStreetMap that don't appear in the settlement layer? Yeah, so I think that's a limitation of the current method. Um, so right now, I think it's solvable if you just add in a processing step to solve the problem with the false positive. Um, I think we're going to be working on it. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's something that we have to discuss on how we're going to approach. So thank you for the suggestion. Um, OK. Um, let's see. Um, what did I skip? Uh, you said that building data are required to know where people live. But if you're, for example, an aid organization want to find out where people live, could you not also look at land use residential or highway residential objects in OpenStreetMap, since these are easier to add for mappers than tracing buildings? Question by Frederick. Yeah, um, yeah I think um, the reason that um, um, we did that exposition is just to explain like some of the motivations for doing the building completeness research, right? Um, I do think that it would be easier if uh, the humanitarian organizations use the like the land use residential tag and whatnot. Um, I think we also have to check um, like if this data is available for like different countries, right? Because I don't know if all the countries have like a land use for residential. And I do understand that, of course, it's like a limitation because, for example, there are some people who don't have, like, who don't live in buildings or don't have houses, right? So that's something that you should also consider. But yeah, I think um, we we will definitely check out, like, trying land use residential and like, other OSM tags. Okay, great. I know that you were uh, still thinking about how extending your method. Um, let's see. Um... Does your method consider different, the different population density? Some buildings may have one story, some may be skyscrapers. So a pixel and a certain value for the population may mean different things. Well, the same population can fit in one building or lots of them, depending on the number of floors. So uh, do you consider that in any way? Um, right, no, right now, no. Um, I think the goal of the work right now is just to, like just like a proof of concept to show that um, this is like a method that could work and it's kind of simple to understand that's also what we're trying to go for here um, it's something that's simple to understand um, 
simple to implement because you know if you're gonna consider like the building density i think the complexity will be like a bit higher so yeah um yeah um i think it's something that we will also be considering okay, um okay um um there's one uh critical comment saying that um um that you have to be a customer of facebook in order to uh acquire uh access to this uh settlement layer and thereby questions the fitness of, of this layer to a project like OpenStreetMap. um also since facebook uh maybe breaking the walls. So could you explain or discuss more the how this layer is available and whether you have to be a customer or not? Um, sure. Um, the data set is actually publicly available. So Facebook has a data for uh, data for good arm um, where they release um, like public data sets for, for everyone's benefit. Um, yeah, I think the the challenge really is um, just um, finding out how to use it, right? And also like the temporal aspect of it, because um, um, they're going to be detecting these buildings, but the it might it might be for like a different year, like it might be for twenty eighteen or maybe even older. And at the same time, I guess um, some some other things that. You, you, you can also consider is like the satellite images, the aerial images that they use. Um, these are like their their own. Um, so they just use that to to like predict like where the buildings are. Um, but the output of the settlement layer, it's freely available for everyone. It's actually in like a humanitarian data exchange. So if you check for Facebook data and humanitarian data exchange, you'll see that it's publicly available. Okay, thanks for this clarification. I think um, uh, corporate editors and, and corporate uh, contributions and using corporate data is um, sometimes a controversial issue, controversial issue in, in OpenStreetMap. And um, um, I'll promote the last talk of the track right now uh, by Jennings Anderson, which would discuss this. Um, so yeah, lots of room for discussion here. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you could clarify it about it. Okay. Um, another question. Are you interpolating over the settlement data or signing pixel to area? Have you tried interpolation? Um, so with this one, again, um, I think uh, we haven't tried it out yet. Um, what we're doing is more, we haven't tried input interpolation yet. Um, what we're doing is more of a, I guess, like a pixel to area sort of thing. Um, we don't have like a one-to-one -one correspondence for the buildings and um, the, the settlement layers. So we're just assuming that if a settlement layer pixel is there, there could be one or more buildings. Um, yeah, no interpolation yet. Okay. Um, yeah, an interesting question is um, about um, how do we use your... Uh, um, your products, um, or meaning with the results for the Philippines, what are your recommendations for the local OSM community in terms of focus in mapping areas? Um, so I think it's really, it's really like two things, right? So you you want to create. So what we found that is useful is you want to create something that's easily understandable for everyone. So the output that we created with the data completeness, um, we could just publish it and, and like release the data. Um, but I think what was helpful in making the volunteers also um, be able to use it is to have a web map. So that's really the the goal um, to make it usable for everyone. And if the web map, if you have a web map, it's going to be more usable because it's going to be more understandable, and they can find where the areas are incomplete and what not. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we still have some time, so um, maybe one more question at least. Um, 
Well, maybe maybe it would be difficult for you to answer that if you didn't uh, um, uh, watch the specific talk. But uh, uh, how do you evaluate Frederick Graham's statement on volunteer versus pay mapping? Given you seen the talk yesterday, uh, with spot three stopping, consequently the mapping stop stops uh, by a goal station. So, if you can comment on the issue of, of paid mapping if we already discussed corporate uh, uh, data. Yeah, so I think I, uh, yeah, so I did watch this talk. Um, I think right now I'm still trying to form my own opinions about it, but I do think that it's important to sort of build the community and just make sure that there's room for everyone. Um, I think that there is room for like volunteer mappers. There's also room for paid mappers. Um, yeah, so I do know I do know that if like there is like if if like um the sponsorships like the funding uh, stops, then the the paid the paid mappers the paid mappers won't be able to map that much anymore. So I think that's that's something that you also have to consider, right? Um, so yeah, I really think that it's just it has to be a conversation in the community and how do you like how do you uh, like how do you try to Make sure that both sides can work together to improve the map, improve the database. Okay, thank you for um, a very sincere uh, uh, response answer. Um, I'll add one last question of, of my own. Um, I found your results for the Philippines very interesting because uh, there's a lot of rich uh, literature about the digital divide in OpenStreetMap data and how urban areas are mapped more than rural areas and uh, high income areas are mapped more than low income areas. And um, the results from the Philippines, if I understood them correctly, show that this is not the case, at least in the Philippines. So do you have an idea why is that in the Philippines, uh, uh, you were discussing about the basically go through city by city, but do you have any evidence for that? And and did you see uh, something similar for Madagascar? Yeah. So I, I think I can only speak to the situation in the Philippines um, since we've been discussing mostly with the um, hot OSM team in the Philippines. Um, based on my understanding, the way that they map is they coordinate with like uh, certain agencies in the government and they focus on these priority provinces first. So I think they focused on one province like in the northern part of Luzon, and then now they're focusing on another one in the southern part of Luzon. Um, so I think that's the reason why it's not necessarily that the, or, or the rural areas are unmapped. So there are some provinces that are very rural, but that, because they're the ones that are chosen to be the priority, that's where a lot of people map. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, so can you repeat the second part of the question? Uh, I think you covered it. Uh, the second part was about Madagascar. So when you said you can uh, mainly explain the, the Philippines uh, context. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it, it was an interesting question and the uh, answer that raises um, the role of organized activity in OpenStreetMap and how that relates to the known uh, biases in the, um, yeah, and I think organizations are something that get more and more research in OpenStreetMap and a good example of, of, of why. Um, yeah, I think we'll uh, finish with that. I think we covered almost all of the questions, if not all of them. Um, I want to thank you again for an interesting talk. Uh, I think uh, there were quite a few interesting questions afterwards and, and a lively discussion. And invite everyone uh, watching or listening to join us for the third talk in five minutes about uh, also about data quality, but this time using uh, user-centric uh, or increasing quality measures. So thank you again, Adi. Thank you so much, everyone.